Oh!
Good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Stewart, your Master of Ceremonies. Thanks so many of you for coming tonight to mark a searing moment of history that our world simply cannot forget. This is an anniversary like no other. Exactly 100 years ago this evening, the sun was setting on the last hours of one age and the beginnings of our modern world. By this very hour in 1914, Russia and Germany were mobilizing for war. Through the next day, Germany and Russia were at war. So was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Over the next few August days, a European war became the World War, as France and then Britain and its empire, including Canada, entered a conflict more destructive than anyone could imagine. It was the war that ended peace, as renowned historian Margaret McMillan called her remarkable account of this still confusing race into war. She will address us shortly. We still live with the effects of that war. Tonight, our in memoriam commemoration will remember those lost in the conflict, including 60,000 Canadians and millions of others, as well as all those whose lives and spirits were forever blighted by its wounds. We remember the fear and sacrifice of so many women across the world, including those who had to work and wait in anxiety over years for a peace that often seemed just a fading dream. I want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional lands here of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. Coincidentally, Tomorrow is the 250th anniversary of the Treaty of Fort Niagara, which reaffirmed the expanded and the covenant chain military alliance between the British Crown and First Nations in Eastern North America. It should be said that Aboriginal Canadians had an extraordinary record of military service in the First World War and other conflicts. Given the nightmarish conditions of that war, we are still amazed by the courage and resilience of all Canada's military, which performs so valiantly. The battle names still resonate down to us. Ypres, the Somme, Vimy Ridge, Passchendaele, Cambrai, Arras, the last 100 days campaign, and so, so many others on land, sea, and in the air. Elements of eight Canadian military units will march here tonight in honor of all our participants in World War I. We begin with the Vimy Ridge fanfare, written for the rededication of our magnificent Vimy Ridge Memorial in 2007 to honor all Canadians who fought and died there. It's performed by members of the massed military bands, the massed pipes, and drums.
Would you now please stand for the arrival of our special guest we're so pleased to have with us tonight, the Honorable David Onley, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, accompanied by Monday! Professor Merrick Gertler, President of the University of Toronto. Her Honor, Ms. Ruth Ann Onley, Mr. Blake Goldring, Honorary Colonel of the Canadian Army and Chairman and CEO of AGF Management Limited. General Thomas Lawson, Chief of the Defense Staff of the Canadian Armed Forces. Mr. Michael Wilson, Chancellor of the University of Toronto. Brigadier General John Fletcher, Head Chaplain of the Canadian Armed Forces. Professor Margaret McMillan, Warden of St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. Chief Warrant Officer Kyle West, Canadian Forces. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Ontario's Lieutenant Governor, David Onley, who brings greetings on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen. David Onley is the 28th Lieutenant Governor of this province and was appointed following a highly distinguished career as a broadcaster. His honor has for many years championed disability issues and serves as Colonel of the Regiment of the Queen's York Rangers and as Honorary Colonel of the 25th Field Ambulance. Please welcome our Lieutenant Governor, David C. Onley. Thank you. Please be seated. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Varsity Stadium this evening to mark the 100th anniversary of World War I. It began as the war to end all wars, but that is not how it ended. Instead, instead like the dragon's teeth of Greek mythology, it sowed nationalism in countries across the globe. It eliminated old boundaries and dangerous alliances, but created new ones, both geographic and social. Canada paid a heavy price for its participation in the Great War in terms of lives lost and wounded. More than 650,000 Canadians served during the war, including more than 2,800 nursing sisters with the Canadian Army Medical Corps and approximately 4,000 Aboriginal Canadians. Over 172,000 casualties, 66,000 who gave their lives, and countless others who carried internal scars that would never leave. Canada had already demonstrated its military prowess at home through the performance of local militias during the War of 1812, but it was in the bloody fields 
and mud-clogged trenches of Flanders that they would prove themselves on an international scale. The different ethnicities and provinces fought together as Canadians for the first time, earning a reputation as one of the most effective forces on the Western Front. And over four days at Vimy Ridge, when all four divisions of the Canadian Corps fought as one formation, they forged a nation. If the seeds of Canadian identity were sown during the War of 1812, they burst into bloom at Vimy. Everything we are and everything we do as Canadians today leads us back to that event and to the sense of confidence and patriotism it created in soldiers and citizens alike. Tonight, as we listen to the mass bands of the Canadian Armed Forces and hear from distinguished speakers, we can relive that heady experience. But as we do so, we must also honour the sacrifices that led to it. And we must vow that we will never forget the men and women who made them. Tonight would not be possible without the dedicated support of our performers, staff, and countless volunteers. I especially thank Canada Company, the University of Toronto, the Bill Graham Centre for Contemporary International History, the Monk School of Global Affairs, and the Canadian Armed Forces for organizing tonight's In Memoriam event. And so, in the name of the Queen, and as her personal representative in the province of Ontario, and on behalf of all of the people of Ontario, thank you for being here, and I wish you all a most memorable evening. The president of the University of Toronto, Merrick Gertler, is the 16th president in this remarkable university's 187-year history, now one of the world's great universities. Dr. Gertler, who is the former dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, is now responsible for 80,000 students and 18,000 staff, as well as massive properties, including this stadium. Like so many others, he wishes to mark the moments when war broke out in 1914, and this university, like so much of society, found itself challenged and changed forever. Please welcome President Gertner. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Your honors, Chancellor Wilson, Mr. Goldring, Professor McMillan, General Lawson, Brigadier General Fletcher, members and veterans of the Canadian Armed Forces, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us in this gathering in memory of the Great War as we mark the centenary of its beginning. On behalf of the University of Toronto, I too would like to thank the Monk School of Global Affairs and the Bill Graham Centre for Contemporary International History for organizing this event, and the Canadian Armed Forces for their support. I offer special thanks to the organizing committee, and, and in particular its chair, Blake Goldring, whose vision for this evening is now wonderfully realized. I would like also to acknowledge and thank Brian Stewart, not only for his outstanding service as our Master of Ceremonies, but also for being the catalyst of the past year's series of events commemorating the war, culminating in this great gathering this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, visitors to this campus are struck by its marvelous buildings, old and new. Invariably, they pause at a uniquely dignified landmark at the heart of it all. The Soldiers' Tower, was built by the University of Toronto Alumni Association as a monument to the members of the university community who gave their lives for our freedom in the war to end all wars. It is maintained with great dedication by the Soldiers Tower Committee of the UTAA. The tower's enduring significance 
is abundantly clear in the addition of a generation later, the names of the universities fallen in the Second World War and in the large solemn gatherings at its base each year on the 11th of November. Indeed, it is a most fitting memorial. Canada was profoundly affected by the war that gave rise to the tower, and so too was this university, from the prominent role on campus over decades of the Canadian Officers Training Corps, to the acceleration of the university's research capabilities and the development of the Connaught Laboratories, which produced vaccines and antitoxins for the Canadian Expeditionary Forces to the work and the sacrifices of every member of the university, men, women, faculty, staff, students, and alumni, to the heroes of different kinds who emerged, Harold Innes, who was wounded at Vimy Ridge, Victoria Cross recipient Thane McDowell, John McRae, and Dr. Norman Bethune, among many others. Our presenters this evening will enlighten us on the broader significance of the First World War. For my part, I offer this thought on what it means for this university. Simply, the record I have sketched provides a singular example of our engagement in the world, of our commitment to helping meet its most profound and pressing challenges. And that record will remain a deep source of inspiration in our teaching, and research missions for every generation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, as the sun continues to set on this last day of peace uh, 100 years ago, we will now hear a collection of music, some sad, some jaunty, set to 1914-18 themes. First, the mass pipes and drums playing dugout at Belcourt and the Battle of the Somme. They are led by senior drum major, master warrant officer, Chris Reeser.
Next, a popular song composed around one of the hardest battles ever fought by Canadians called The Road to Passchendaele, led by Pipe Major Ian Lang of the 48th Highlanders of Canada. Some of the music heard here tonight will have echoed through Toronto 100 years ago in 1914 as troops raced to join up and bands played and fruit fans marched through the city. In fact, we recall now the spirit of 1914 as the combined bands play a great little army composed in that year. Hugely popular then, it has since become the official march past of the Canadian Army and is led here by drum major Mike Morello of the Royal Regiment of Canada.
soloist is Danielle Bore, who will sing a Requiem for a Soldier. This was composed for the highly regarded Band of Brothers TV series. It has become a tribute to all those in past and present conflicts who lost their lives in the service of their country. shining dream of open love, life and liberty, with a host of brave unknown soldiers for your company, we can live of sacrifice heroes paid the price young men who died for all man's wars gone to paradise where are all one great band of brothers and one day you'll see we can live to the world is free, when the world is free, I wish you live to see. Well, thank you so much. The music of World War I has a remarkable ability to transport us back in time. And now we're going to uh, again be transported back to 1914. And I'd like to introduce our next soloist, musician Olivier Lacaire of the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada and the combined bands playing Till the Boys Come Home. This is a medley of First World War songs are arranged especially for tonight by Director of Music, Captain Bill Mighton. When the band plays 
schedule called Tipperary. There's joy right in their eyes. God save our gracious king. Good luck to the boys of the Allies. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I'd love to remain in bed. For the hardest blow of all is to hear the bugles call. You've got to get up, you've got to get up this morning. Oh, boy, the minute the battle is over. Oh, boy, the minute the foe is dead. I'll put my uniform away and move to Philadelphia and spend the rest of my life in bed. Shining, turn the dark cloud inside out till the boys come home. Ah, little Colleen. By the poplars, she listens and starts and trembles. Is the first little song of love. Roses are shining in Picardy in the hush of the silver dew. Roses are flowering in Picardy, but there's never a rose like you. And the roses will die with the summertime, and our roads may be far apart. But there's one rose that dies not in Picardy. Is the rose that I keep in my heart? It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary, and the sweetest girl I know. Piccadilly, farewell Leicester Square. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. And to keep your home fires burning bright till the boys come home. Wasn't that great? We welcome back Daniel Boré to sing I'm Dreaming of Home, a song written for the 2005 French film, Joyeux Noël, which depicts the famous Christmas truce of 1914, when many Allied and German soldiers left trenches and mingled for hours in no man's land, a stunning moment of humanity amid the carnage of war.
the sounds of rivers singing, a song I've often heard. It flows through me now, so clear and so loud. I stand where I am and forever. I see the land so fair, my heart opens wide, there's sadness inside, I stand where I am and forever. Thank you, Danielle. Interesting how the emotional resonance still of the First World War continues to inspire music and art and all manner of reflections on the war. The combined bands now will march off to Cock of the North, a Scottish tune that became a popular marching number in World War I. You hear it now as it was heard in countless villages and assembly areas in France and Belgium.
50 members of the Royal Canadian Regiment and 50 reservists from local units. The debate over the First World War, because it is still so relevant to our world, seems as strong on the 100th anniversary as it did decades ago. What caused it? What did it rot? Historians still seek to unravel the inner dynamics of its beginning and all those aftershocks that affected just about everything. One of the leading experts on both the war's beginnings and its diplomatic end, Margaret Macmillan, the acclaimed author previously of the blockbuster success, Paris 1919, about the conference of peace and the Versailles Treaty, and now the war that ended peace, about the road to 1914. Surely one of the most quoted historians today, Margaret Macmillan, is professor of international history at Oxford, where she is also warden of St. Anthony's College. She has strong ties to our University of Toronto. She served as provost of Trinity College and also is now senior fellow at Massey College and fellow of Monk School of Global Affairs. Margaret McMillan will offer us her perspectives on a war she has studied in enormous detail. It's always a great honor to welcome her back. Margaret. I'd like, first of all, to add my thanks to the organizers of this extraordinary event. It really is an amazing occasion. But I'd also like to thank all of you who have come tonight for this. I think it's wonderful that we're here to commemorate an event 100 years ago which has changed our world, which has affected our world, and to which many of us will have connections. We come in Canada from many different parts of the world, and we all probably have someone in our families or know of someone who fought in that great struggle on either side. And I think very important that now, 100 years later, we commemorate all those who fought in that great war. 100 years ago today, Europe was on the edge of the catastrophe. Germany and Russia had already mobilized, and their enormous armies were beginning to move towards the frontiers. Austria-Hungary had already declared war on Serbia. It remained for Britain, France, and Italy to decide what they were going to do. And by the 4th of August, France was at war with Germany, and Britain had made the decision to come into the war, a decision which it made on behalf of the British Empire, and so Canada on the 4th of August, along with Australia, New Zealand, India, South Africa, Newfoundland, and all the other parts of the great British Empire now found itself at war. And so what had started as a European war became a world war. It was a war that confounded expectations. Many had assumed that it would be over by Christmas, that it would be a decisive war, 
that the nations would sit down after a brief period of fighting and make a peace. And of course, as we now know, those expectations were confounded. The war turned out to be a war of stalemate on its many fronts. On the Eastern Front, there were great battles, but no decisive winners. On the Western Front, as we know, the armies settled into that long line of trenches, which ran from the English Channel to the Swiss border. And the war dragged on year after year after year, over four years of a struggle which few had foreseen, and yet which consumed the lives probably of nine million men. I think we'll never know for sure how many died in that war. Twice as many again were wounded, and of course in many cases never really recovered from their wounds. The war drew in the resources of the countries that fought it. It hastened the spending down of the resources of what had been a very rich part of the world. And as it dragged on, it drew in other nations, from Japan to Brazil, and of course in 1917, the United States. It was a war which changed, I think, forever the world. We look back at the period before 1914, and it seems a very different sort of world. Europe was the center of the world. It was the most powerful part of the world through its great empires, of which, of course, Canada was part, and through its informal empires of trade and investment, Europe controlled most of the world's surface. Europe was where you came if you wanted to get the latest science and technology. Europe was where you came if you wanted to borrow money. Europe had the best weapons. Europe was the world's power. By the end of the war, Europe had, in effect, thrown that away. We look back at that Europe of 1914, and we think, how can they have done it? How can a Europe which had known such progress and such prosperity and such peace in the 19th century thrown away with both hands its incredible riches and its incredible advantages? And the world, of course, after 1918 was a different world. Europe's decline was hastened, and the European continent itself was torn by a whole host of passions which had been unleashed by the war. You can see the tensions in Europe before the First World War. You can see the tensions of national rivalries, economic rivalries, rivalries for colonies, military plans, arms races, but I think few expected that those tensions would result in that catastrophe for Europe. And what seems to have made it all the more awful was that for all that loss and all that waste and all that expenditure, Nothing much had really been settled. And a whole host of small wars broke out after 1918 as the Great War ended, as Winston Churchill called them the Wars of the Pygmies. And Europe was left a troubled continent. The war had helped to unleash the poisons of ethnic nationalism, and so peoples turned one on the other who had lived together for centuries as neighbors. And Europeans were more prepared after 1918 to resort to violent politics, Bolshevism on the left and fascism on the right. I think without the First World War, without what it did to European society, without the way in which it habituated Europeans to violence and to violent solutions, we would not have seen the very troubled 1920s and 1930s. It is, I think, fair to say that the First World War, if it did not lead directly to the Second World War, created the conditions in which that war happened. The war also began the decline of the great European empires. They were probably bound to go anyway, but they, I think, went much more quickly than they might have done. Canada, which entered the war very much as a junior partner of the British by the time the war was over, had become a very different sort of country. And so the war for us, although it involved tremendous sacrifice, was also a very important part of our historical evolution. We became, in the course of that war, much more conscious of ourselves as Canadians. We became much more aware of our contribution to the war effort, a contribution of manpower, but also a contribution of resources, a contribution of money, a contribution in so many ways. We were much more independent after the First World War was over. The other awful thing, and there were many awful things, I think, about the First World War, 
was that no one still knows how it started, and that is frightening. Europe went so quickly from peace to war. It took five weeks, a very short period indeed, in human affairs. On the 28th of June in Sarajevo, the Archduke, the heir to the Austrian throne, was murdered. The Austrian government suspected that Serbia was behind it. It seized the opportunity to do what it had been wanting to do for some time, and that is destroy Serbia. And it had Germany's backing to do it. Two decisions were made then which narrowed Europe's options, which made it more likely that it would go to war. And then the final decision that I think took Europe decisively towards war was that Russia decided that it would back Serbia. I think they felt until almost the last moment, almost until today, 100 years ago, that they could still pull back. They were gambling, and I think they were waiting for the other side to back down. And this time, the other side did not back down. And I think for us, it's a warning that we can still go so quickly from that period of peace, that period of prosperity, that period of progress into something so dreadful. And there are, I think, worries at the moment that we live in a world which has uncomfortable similarities to that world of 1914. We have troubled spots in the world which may draw in great power conflict. We have national and ethnic rivalries which are tearing countries to pieces. We have arms races between certain countries. And these, I think, should indeed worry us. And so, as we commemorate this war, we're, I think, tying the past together with the present. The past won't offer us lessons, but it may offer us warnings. I think for us in Canada to remember the war is to remember it in a truly international way. We are people who have come from many parts of the world, and I think very important to remember the First World War as a global war, as a war which crossed nations, where many nations shared in the burdens of that war, where the changes brought by that war were felt in many different nations. Canadians come from both the countries that fought on the Allied side and from the countries that fought on the side of the Central Powers. And I think now, 100 years later, we are all remembering together because the war was a shared experience. We must, I think, respect those who fought on all sides in that conflict. They had no idea of what they were getting into. They fought bravely. They fought, as they thought, for a good cause. And I think what we must never do is condescend to those in the past and assume they didn't know what they were doing. They fought. They dedicated themselves to their countries. They were prepared to give the most precious thing they had, and that was their lives. And many, of course, did. I think that all we can do now is hope very sincerely that we won't ask for such sacrifices again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. No national institution was as affected by World War I as our Canadian military that went off to win battle honors and through its sacrifice and success won a new degree of Canadian independence on the world stage. To speak for the military, we're glad to have with us the Canadian Armed Forces Chief of the Defense Staff, General Tom Lawson a graduate of Royal College, Military College of Canada, and a former fighter pilot during the Cold War, General Lawson has served in various ranks of high responsibility, including Deputy Commander of North American Air Defense Command, NORAD. He's been our top soldier for almost two years, and it's a real pleasure to ask him to speak to us now. Thank you very much, Brian. Your honors, distinguished guests, and there are so many members of the Canadian Armed Forces, past and present, staff and students of the University of Toronto. Ladies and gentlemen, Mesdames and Messieurs, it's quite an honor to be here with you as we gather in remembrance of the great sacrifices of so many Canadians during the First World War. Professor McMillan, Barbara, it's such a pleasure to listen to your remarks this evening and I thank you for providing in your works such thoughtful context for the consideration of not only readers worldwide, but more particularly of those general officers such as myself, 
charged with the defense of Canadians and Canadian interests, this context is so important. Ladies and gentlemen, as I'm sure you know and as we've heard, Professor McMillan is herself a daughter of Toronto and of course has many personal connections to the Great War. She's also a great Canadian and we look forward to her publications to come. Now I've been asked, as Brian said, to offer a military perspective on the First World War. At first blush it may seem to Canadian youth like a remote war fought long ago and far away by distant relatives. And today, even a century past, as Professor McMillan said, many aspects of the war and its effects upon Canadian society remain the subject of debate and controversy. So what, I, what can I share with you this evening that is beyond the reach of any such controversy? Well, I could talk about the tactics brought about by that war through military science, changes that were prompted by enormous advances in technology, advancements that even in the span of the Great War itself increased the power and accuracy of the artillery, for instance. Artillery that rained down, for example, on my grandfather, my namesake, Thomas Lawson, a son of Toronto himself, as he advanced in line in Cambrai in 1918. Or advancements in aircraft. As a fighter pilot myself, it's hard to believe the difference between the aircraft we have today and the Sopwith Camel, my other grandfather, Norman Moran, again a son of Toronto, flew alongside his colleagues in the Royal Flying Corps. I could talk about the great generalship of Sir Arthur Curry, once a student at the University of Toronto, and others down the chain of command as Canadians fought for the first time as a distinct nation. We might celebrate the heroic individual efforts of the 71 Victoria Cross winners in the First World War. Great warriors such as Billy Bishop in the skies over the trenches, Frederick Fisher at the Second Battle of Ypres, Thane McDowell, as Professor Gertler mentioned at Vimy Ridge, or Jean Briand's heroism at Amiens just before the end of the Great War. Similarly, I could remark upon the courage and strength of those who practiced medicine during the conflict, like Surgeon Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, another graduate of the University of Toronto, famous for writing in Flanders Fields, or we could speak of the courage of the ladies known as the Bluebirds, Canada's military nurses. Or I could simply mention the names of battles and actions indelibly stamped in our collective conscience. Second Ypres, the Somme, Vimy Ridge, Passchendaele. But fundamentally, the story of Canada in the First World War is the story of Canadians and their families, Canadians who sacrificed for their country. And you don't have to go very far to see evidence of this sacrifice and the respect that our society had and has for these warriors. Here in Toronto, like so many communities across the country, you can find memorials to those who fought and never returned. We see the memorials scattered across Toronto and even in the college buildings of this great university. The University of Toronto itself, of course, was deeply affected. Much of this campus given over to military activity during those war years. And of course, the many brave men and women who left this academic world to fight in another. For them, we have Soldiers Tower. As Professor Gertler mentioned, just a few steps from here, a magnificent and moving visage that longingly appeals for us to never break faith with those who died. Canada sent many thousands of our best and brightest, and as we've heard, many did not come back. And ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to my central point to this evening, to recognize that it's not really institutions or cities or even countries that make these sacrifices. Primarily, it's individuals and their families. Families producing the caliber of people who volunteer to serve their country. Serving not in ignorance or in bloodlust, but in the belief that giving something to their society is of immeasurable value. And that is the thread that links us through the hundred intervening years, the values that we still hold dear in the Canadian Armed Forces today. And tonight we solemnly recognize the sacrifice of those thousands of families across Canada who gave their own flesh and blood. Those families rent asunder by the conflict, their grief unending. 
the long tail of war and its lifelong impacts, but of those who lost loved ones, also those who bore the impact of wounds and what we recognize in this century as post-traumatic stress disorder. Those who would grow up knowing nothing of their fathers, their brothers, their uncles, nothing but the fading photograph and the memorial plaque known as the dead man's penny. Canada's population back then was a touch under 8 million. From this number, as we've heard, more than 650,000 served, 66,000 Canadians killed, and three times that number wounded. Can you imagine? Thankfully, today we live in a different world in which such losses are almost beyond comprehension. Yes, the level of technology is very different. I mentioned my grandfather's Sopwith Camel aircraft. He flew a century ago. It was made of plywood and fabric. Contrast this with our CF-18s in service today and our next generation of fighter craft to come with advanced avionics, composite materials, and standoff weapons. But even with those advanced tools, the Canadian Armed Forces is still an organization centered on its people. And I can say without hesitation that without the love and support of their families, today's men and women in uniform, all those you see behind you, behind me this evening on the field, would not be able to serve Canada as they do every day at home and abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, I assure you that the Canadian Armed Forces rests upon your support. A great deal of that heartfelt support comes from right here in Toronto, though whether it be the Forces Appreciation Events at Leafs, Raptors, or Blue Jays games, or the thoughtful and considerable fundraising efforts of the business community and local organizations, or the, delight, the dignified culmination of the Highway of Heroes during our time in Afghanistan. We have seen much of this incredible support, and I can tell you, your men and women in uniform are immensely grateful for it. Ladies and gentlemen, the Canadian experience of the First World War taught us many lessons, lessons that continue to resonate today. We realized then that Canada was unavoidably part of the international system, and Canada had to play its role within it, and we've not forgotten this. Our leaders, both at home and at the front, faced tremendous strains and agonizing decisions. As a result, we knew ourselves and our society a little better, gaining through hard lessons a more nuanced understanding of the Canadian values of diversity and difference. And we realized the challenge of caring for veterans when they leave active service. You know, it's sobering to realize that our grandfathers and great-grandfathers came from a generation that buried their trauma and grief, perhaps necessarily as a result of the enormous numbers. But we are moving away from that era of silent suffering. We're making great progress in helping our people prepare for the traumas they may face in theaters of conflict, and we will continue to ask them to face those theaters, and we've taught them and we teach them how to process and debrief trauma the traumatic incidents they face, and how to decompress from combat operations before returning to their families. None of this in place 100 years ago. Over the last decade in the Canadian Armed Forces, we've developed a world-class mental health system. And while we've not found all the right answers yet, we've come a long way in addressing these issues. So tonight, let us remember those who fell while serving Canada, and let us remember what they were fighting for. They fought for freedom. In this centenary of the beginning of the First World War, I urge all Canadians, young and old, to go and discover your history for yourselves. It's yours. You own it. Read the fascinating histories that have been written by great historians like Professor McMillan. Discover and celebrate your own families and communities' connections. Explore local museums and monuments. Visit our great National War Museum in Ottawa. Participate in local events like this one here tonight and share thoughts with your school friends or your work colleagues. And form your own perspectives and understanding because thinking for yourself is what real freedom is all about. And if you need a reminder of that, look around you and take inspiration from the example of the brave young men and women who left the security of this beautifully cloistered campus to serve their country overseas. I'd like to thank Honorary Colonel Blake Goldring and his entire team of organizers for this evening's event. 
been a pleasure having the opportunity to address you this evening, and I thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, General. And now the commemorative section of the program begins with the march of the combined bands playing Minstrel Boy and Vive le Canadien. Two old sentimental numbers, one from Ireland and the other from Quebec, that became great favorites of our soldiers during the war. At this hour, it's very fitting to remember those thousands upon thousands of Canadians who rest tonight still in those lands of our allies at the time, France and Belgium. And, and uh, there are many memorials to our dead uh, in, in Europe. Few are as poignant quite as the famed Menin Gate in Ypres, Belgium, where the names are engraved of over 54,800 Commonwealth soldiers who died in the local battlefields, but whose bodies have never been identified or found. Every night there, at 8 o'clock, the town has arranged the plane of the last post and Reveille for those names. It remains one of the pilgrimages of the war, the poignancy 
at the moment does not dim. To remind us now of how vast that Commonwealth Army was, we now hear the combined bands playing King George V's Army. The pipe major of the Gordon Highlanders who composed this in World War I, G.S. McLennan, later died of his own war wounds. We will now hear a song resonant of our nation's past, People of the Maple Leaf, originally named Highland Cathedral, which was given a new set of lyrics by His Honor, Lieutenant Governor David Onley, and will be sung by his wife, a noted singer, Ruth Ann Onley. People of the Maple Leaf pays tributes to all those peoples who founded our country and to whose and the, we're proud to defend it in war and in peace. Ruth Ann Only is joined by members of the Canadian Children's Opera Company, conducted by Adine Mintz. Strong were the people of the ice and snow. Brave were the people of the spear and bow. Guardians of land, of tree, of sky and sea. They were the people of the maple leaf. Bold were the people from across the sea. Those who would build this land so strong and free. Dreaming of lives of hope, of faith and peace. They were the people of the maple leaf. Guns did roar. And the flags they flew, the call to arms, they answered true. Times of war, both near and far, they gave their lives to guard this land, my home, so 
grand. We are the people of the Maple Leaf, proud to defend our home in war and peace. Guardians of land, of tree, of sky and sea, we are the people of the Maple Leaf. Our next number is performed by soloist Jean Miso, who teaches music with the aid of sign language for those with developmental disabilities, and who's also strongly connected to veterans' anniversaries. Here she sings her composition, We'll Never Forget, accompanied on guitar by Daniel <coughs> Bure and the Toronto Children's Choir. It's dedicated to our armed forces, men and women, past and present, who serve our country with dedication.
Thank you. As we move closer to the hours when the First World War began, we are in solemn moments. I would like now to introduce the Chaplain General of the Canadian Armed Forces, Brigadier General John Fletcher. General Fletcher has been with the Canadian Forces for 25 years and has officiated many moments of deep historical significance like tonight. As we take a moment for prayer and reflection, I invite each of you to turn your hearts toward the God of your own understanding or simply to focus your thoughts in a moment of quiet contemplation as others pray. Let us pray. O God, our Creator, who has been our strength and help from one generation to the next, we gather this evening to remember and to lament to remember the events of a hundred years ago this week and the beginning of a war that was to end all wars, and to lament the terrible and tragic loss of life in that world war and in the wars and conflicts that have followed it. We are humbled and grateful, O oh God, for all those who throughout the course of history have made the supreme sacrifice while working for the well-being and security of others. Yet still we acknowledge with remorse and dismay the terrible loss of life that our human conflicts have wrought. We beg your forgiveness, O God, and ask that our hearts and minds be made anew, such that we might, each one and all of us together, strive to ensure that the events we commemorate this week might never need happen again. We pray for all who are in bereavement, disability, and pain, and all who continue to suffer the consequences of oppression, war, and terror. May we be inspired by your grace and guidance, O God, to bring to them healing, hope, and justice. Watch over, we pray, the men and women of our Canadian Armed Forces who serve and defend our nation. Guide them and protect them, O God, and strengthen their families and loved ones. We pray as well for Canada and for its leaders and peoples. We are humbled and indeed duty-bound, O God, that the sacrifices of so many paved the way for the freedoms and responsibilities we are so very blessed to enjoy and must never take for granted. May we never forget their courage and loyalty, nor the responsibility that is ours to honor their sacrifice by working for a world of justice, generosity, and peace. Give us wisdom to learn from the past and strength to face the future. Help us to remember the costs of war and to work together for a better and brighter tomorrow for the whole human family and for all the generations that will come after us. We ask all this in your holy name. Amen. Tonight's evening hymn, so familiar, will be accompanied by some lines of poetry. One of the greatest poets of the war, Wilfred Owen, imagined it breaking on civilization and shattering it before the storm. Some lines from his starkly titled, 1914. War broke, and now the winter of the world, with perishing great darkness, closes in. The foul tornado is over all the width of Europe world, rending the sails of progress. Rent or furled are all arts ensigns. Verse wails. Now begins famines of thought and feeling. 
And autumn softly fell, a harvest home, a slow, grand age, and rich with all increase. But now for us, wild winter, and the need of sowings for new spring, and blood for seed. Owen felt poetry of war was in the pity. In his famous anthem for a doomed youth, he thinks of all war's lost youth remembered at dusk like this. In his closing lines, bugles calling for them from sad shires, what candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes. So shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor a girl's brow shall be their pall. Their flowers, the tenderness of silent pines. And each slow dusk, a drawing down of blinds. Would you please now stand as we remember with the playing of The Last Post, The Lament, and Reveille, which will be immediately followed by our national anthems.
Just before we depart tonight, I'd like to acknowledge the organizers of this event, the Monk School of Global Affairs and the Bill Graham Center for the Study of Contemporary International History. Main sponsors have been RBC Wealth Management Fund, Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education, City of Toronto, Canada Company, and the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs of Ontario. And aside from sponsors, we must thank Blake Goldring, the chair of the organizing committee, and all the participating regiments of the Canadian Armed Forces. Now, if you would finally stand once more for the departure of our vice regal party. Thank you. And now as we depart, our assembled bands will march off to one of the great patriotic songs of our nation's history, The Maple Leaf Forever.